You have to create. You have to create a, a fantasy organization, and you call it, it is a religion. But Matthew 3. You just don't care what God says. Well, Catholics will tell you that. They trump the word of God. They have the last word. Amazing. The Satan's power. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of uh, by the prophet Isaiah saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his path straight. I'm having trouble with my, my sight here. And the same John had his raiment of camel hair and a leather, a leather girdle, girdle about his loins and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the regions round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. People in Jerusalem and round about Jordan came in Judea, came to John to be baptized of him, confessing their sins. Today, we'll read about it later on. Now I'll get to it. Today, or as on as any Sunday, people <laughs> they, 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 they gather, they pass, he says, you open the doors to the church, and everybody that believes in what he's been saying and so forth, come up to the front of the church or go to this room and get water baptized. That's fantastic. Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, 15 through 20. I'm looking at, at uh, what God has to say about the purpose of his baptism, his ritual, and how these organizations have uh, harvested this information out to seduce people, it's, uh, it's put them in a, in a, in, in a, a religious coma, but to help put them into this coma by having them believe that they have a special relationship with God. This, this water thing, that this, this water hobby that they practice. Map Mark 16, 15 through 20 has two issues that I want to point out. There's a religious organization called Church of Christ. They shun being called the uh, Campbellites. They don't, <laughs> they have no, nothing to do with it. But they claim that the spiritual powers in this narrative are done away with after the death of the apostles. Some of them, because all of these sects, they have different, they, they have different tenets, they have different dogma that they go by, you know. But let's read through this 
And there's two peculiar things about who does the baptizing and the spiritual gifts in this baptism. This baptism. Mark chapter 15, 16, verses 15 through 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He's speaking to the 12 apostles, of course, 11. And he that believeth in his baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So either you have to do these, these, these I don't know what call them candlelights. These Church of Christ people say that, see, you cannot be saved. You cannot be saved unless you're saved by Mark 16, 16. He cannot be saved. Now, how do you tell somebody that? And then you turn around and tell them something, anything about Calvary. Well, you know, if you, and you, and you, some of these people are sincere when they say this stuff. You cannot be saved unless you're water baptized yet. What happened at Calvary? And they tell people about Calvary, and they tell people about water baptism. This just makes no sense. But I'm talking about the people who are, who are lying like this, who, who are this, 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 who, who are saying these things, teaching people this stuff. They don't care what God said. They don't care. If they did care, he wouldn't be a Church of Christ. He wouldn't be a Roman Catholic. He wouldn't be a Methodist, Baptist, Episcopalian. He wouldn't be any of them. He'd be in the church, which is in the body, if he believed the Bible. Seventeen. And these signs shall follow them which believe. It's impossible. Well, God says it's not possible to separate the sign gifts from the water baptism. But they say that they're done away with it because they say it's done away. They're done away with it. Not what God said. These <laughs> the important word in this narrative. And these signs shall follow them. Everybody today that's water baptized, they should have these sign gifts. If they, if the Church of Christ, if they believe this, if they believe this, if they believe that you saved by this water baptism, you should have the same sign. It says them, not the twelve apostles only. Them, if the twelve apostles no longer exist, you still water baptized, and you still should have these sign gifts. Otherwise, you're lying. But they had this information from the victims, from people who were there trying to swoon. This game, this game is a con game. Man-made religion is a con game. Man-made Christianity. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. <laughs> well, you know, this pandemic is going on for two years and they still dipping them in water and people are still coming up sick, and people are still being sick and dying. Christians dying. And they still have the olive oil, and it doesn't work. They put, but there's some of them here the olive oil. But let me get through this. So then after the Lord has spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and set on the right hand of God. Hmm. And they went forth and preached everywhere, and the Lord working with them and confirming, confirming the sign gifts and confirming the word with signs following. If you say you water baptized in the day and God told you to water baptize, prove it. Show me a sign. Prove it. Heal this arthritis problem I have. Heal this eye problem I have. If you said that it's, it's 
You have the sign and gifts, prove it. He can't because he's lying. There's a guy, he's, he's, I'm, I'm not ashamed to name, I have to name these people. This guy Jennings, he's a one that's Pentecostalist. Well, he's just called himself a Pentecostal anymore. He came from the an apostolic organization that was started out there in California, you know, Pentecostalism. And uh, he has he has charmed these people. He, some of these people dressed up with the head covers because he misinterprets the, uh, uh, he, he, he gives the wrong application to certain verses. And he has all these women wrapped up in the heads, wrapped up in men and separated the men from the women on one side and the organization to the other side. It's so the men on one side. And he's, he says that you cannot be saved. You cannot be saved unless you're baptized by Acts, by Acts 2.38 and have been baptized in the Holy Ghost and speak with tongues. And that's the sign that you can tell that the person is saved. And he has a, a tank, it's got I it's about six or seven foot of water in the thing. And he boasts about how many people he's baptized all over the world. And people go for this because people want this identification. You, when you water baptize, you identify closer to God, you identify with God. That's wonderful. But all you get is wet, and, 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 and they tell them you have to take them someplace so they can talk in tongues, learn how to talk in tongues. And people go for it because people want to be accepted. And that's, and that's, 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 that's the crux, that's, that's the foundation of any con game. What is that person's dream? You find out what his, what his dream is, and you show them the possibility of a dream coming true. And you can milk the person. You can you can just milk them for whatever you can milk them for. You can, whatever you can get, you can milk them. Continuing to show them there's a possibility for the dream to come true, and you can do it with the Bible. And they do. But what if you believe that God is not a man that He should lie? If you approach it like, and you hear one of these people say, "You cannot be saved outside of Acts two thirty eight." Let's look at this information. Acts 2, the start of 22 through 38. This is simple. When you believe that God is not a man, it's simple. Because you have to ask yourself, well, why, why isn't it not happening in my life? And you ask God, why is not? You got all this information. Why is it not happening in my life? Ask God. And then you, you say, God said that, Pastor. God said this. Well, He said He 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 didn't He didn't really mean it that way. Yeah, He's got to He's got to give you an alternative to what God said. And then you say, Well, if He didn't mean it that way, why didn't He tell me what He meant? To, tell me where I can find out what He meant. And then if I'm a Jew, <laughs> you said. If this is a Jewish ritual, I should have everything that the Jewish program, but God is the covenants of God made with Israel, I should have them. If you said that I'm spiritual Israel, Israel or replace with Israel, I should have the same things. Acts chapter two, verses 22 through, I'm gonna just start at 22. Because this guy Jennings, he says, you cannot be saved outside of Acts 2.38. But what he does, it's no different than the rest of these man-made organizations. He doesn't care what God says about verses 22 and 23. He doesn't care. He does not care. You men of Israel, hear these words. You men of Israel. Genesis is Israel now. He said, well, it doesn't make any difference. There had to be some Gentiles there. Well, you, the Gentile can't be baptized and join the, 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 the church, the Israeli church. He can't be baptized and join the Jewish church. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered out of the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken, 
and by wicked hands they're crucified and slain. They knew who he was. He proved it. God proved it. But they said, I don't care. He's interfering with our hustle. Same thing going on now with this Gideon guy. All of these man-made outfits. They don't care what God says. For David, speaking concerning him, I foresaw, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. More also my face of my flesh and not for rest and hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. I'm struggling with my sight here. So let's go to uh, 37, Acts 36, 37. Uh, 2, 36, 37, 38. Acts chapter 2, verses 36, 37, 38. 36, therefore, therefore Jennings and people practicing Acts 2.38, not only him, but apostolic Pentecostalist people, Acts 2.38, 2.38, they practice Acts 2.38. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know they're Israel, they are Israel. They say that means me too. I don't care what God says. That means me too. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely that God had 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 made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter. Said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. They say that every Sunday. Say it. And people victimized, they just sit there and listen to this nonsense. It's in the Bible. And they turn around and say that you get in the water and then you, you for the remission of your sins. Well, what happened at Calvary? I don't care. That part is not in, included in this, in this sermon that he's preaching to that, that day, at that Sunday. He's talking about Acts 2.38, and that's the only baptism you can be saved at. Well, something's wrong. First Corinthians 15. Something's wrong. And it's not with the word of God. And these con men use the same, they can use the same Bible I'm using. Something's wrong, and it's not with the word of God. Either you're going to believe that God is not a man of using that. And he speaks about this in Romans 1. Who changed the truth of God into a lie, worship, and serve the creature. More than the creator who's blessed forever. Amen. This, this is not new. This happening today. They, say, they don't care what God says. He just farms out information from the God gave a nation for the nation of Israel, found out the information that God gave it to the Apostle Paul for the church, for the, for the body of Christ, and constructs an organization he calls it the church. And they have, a, they, have another, they have a religion. They created a religion. And people go for it because it's fun. It's, you know, it has promise. It's about you. It's not about what God is doing. It's about you. He's got a special plan for your life. It's about you. And he can go for it, changing the focus. But he said, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And Jesus said, he that baptized shall be saved, that he that believeth not shall be damned. Wait. But the Apostle Paul says in Acts, I mean, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, Moreover, brethren, he's speaking to the, the Apostle Paul, speaking to the church, which is his body. Brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and by which also you stand, by which also you are saved. But wait a minute. 
Peter says that you have to repent and be baptized if it wanted to be for the remission of sins. And Jesus said that he that is baptized shall be saved. But Paul says, and, and he says, I delivered unto you that gospel by which also you have received and by wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. Well, what is that? If you keep in memory of what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received from who? How did Christ die for your sins according to the scriptures? And that he was buried and then he rose again the third, third day according to the scriptures. Paul said that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is the gospel by which you're saved. But they don't care about a dispensational approach to the Bible. It interferes with their hustle. It destroys that man-made organization. If you believe that God is not a man that he should lie, you have to tell me why Paul would say something like that. <clears throat> and yet Peter says something entirely different. Well, he said, Peter says that preachers of baptism for salvation. And it's true that God said it's the word of God. But the seduction is powerful, it's satanic, it's powerful. Because the focus, you put the focus on the, on the, on the person, that the victim, the Bible is about you. God's got a special plan <laughs> for you. But there's certain things that you have to do and the things that you have to do conforms to the organization's plan for you. Romans 6, chapter 3 and 4. You see, as the, the way I would confront one of these kind men is just, this, this is my confrontation with him. The word baptism is in Paul's epistles. I think one about four times. Says it makes no difference what he says about baptism. Because we practice water baptism whenever he, whenever he says the word baptism in his epistles. That's water. I would say, well, Pastor, you claim that Romans 6, 3 and 4 is water. Let's just see. Romans 6, chapter, Romans chapter 6. Verses one through four. What shall we say there? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? I don't, I don't, I have no, I have no reservations about being cynical with these people. Because, you know, I would confront him and tell him he's lying. You know, you lying. It's game that you tell him. You, 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 you are lying about the word of God. And, so, and I'll prove to you you lying. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer then? Know you not that so many of us was baptized into Jesus Christ was baptized into his death? Therefore, we're bad with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead, oh, excuse me, raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, we so, so shall we also should walk in the newness of life. He says, water. That's a ritual operation. The Baptist, the Catholic, the Methodist, whoever it is, Pentecostalist, that's water. Well, perhaps <laughs> Pentecostalist, you, okay, you make that water. That means so many of us were baptized in the Jesus Christ is baptized in So when you dunk him down in the water and you immerse him, he's supposed to die. And then when you raise him up, he from the water, you're supposed to bring him back to life. If you make that water, you have to kill him, you have to drown him, and then bring him back to life. If you don't kill him and bring him back to life, you're lying about the verse of being water baptism. Well, 
Well, what is the baptism here? First Corinthians. Chapter 12. Let's start at 13, at 12 and 13. For as the body is one and had many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. This is a real baptism. Romans 6, 3 and 4 is a real baptism. Acts 2, 38 is a ritual baptism. You, the person that wrote Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, is the same person that wrote 1 Corinthians 12, 13. In Romans 6, 3 and 4, he said, we're, no, you're not so many. It was baptized into Jesus Christ who baptized in his death. Paul wrote that in Romans 6, 3. And Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 12, 13, by one spirit. So what was he, what did he change from water to spirit? And, huh. No, you're just lying about Romans 6, 3, and 4, because that's what your organization practices. And you have to maintain that illusion. I guess I have about five more minutes. That same, uh, not only him, I just heard a guy this morning. He's uh, that uh, Urban Armstrong, that 10 Lost Tribes nonsense. He says there's only one baptism in the Bible. When we did an exhaustive study on this, uh, and a Saturday Bible study, and even a, you know, a Sunday morning Bible study about baptisms. I have over 12 that I have, you know, that uh, that I've been able to uh, identify. But what's so cruel about these people? You see, these people, they, they, they have more scriptural uh, 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 vocabulary than I have. And most, and they use the same Bible I used, came to the Bible. But yet they said there's only one baptism in the Bible. That's, you know, that's, it's just so cruel, it's so blatant, you know, to just lie right, you know, lie like that to a person. And so they, Ephesians 6, I'm sorry, Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 4. What, what it is, they just don't care what, what, what God said. They don't care. If it interferes with their hustle. Ephesians chapter 4. If you believe the Bible, then wouldn't have these denominations. If you believed it. Or if not better yet, if he cared, if he cared what God said. He doesn't care that God is not a man he should lie. That's, that's the foundational truth. He does not care. He doesn't have a problem reading the verse. He just doesn't care what the verse said. If it conflicts with his hustle, he doesn't care. And he can make it say what he wants it to make, say. I, I know it says that, but it, it don't mean that. It doesn't say that. He, he doesn't even get to the don't mean that. He said it doesn't say that. And that, that, that verse that we just read, uh, 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 1 Corinthians 12, 13. I've even had a, I read about a, a, a Baptist, a Dr. So-and-so. He says that that verse, that's water baptism. He said, because... It says that, but it doesn't, it, what it says, it doesn't say that. What are you talking about? It doesn't say that. He said, about one, about one spirit. What do you mean it doesn't say that? Before we can get to it, it doesn't mean that. Tell me, how you come tell me it doesn't say that? Then we, if you said, it, well, it, at least it says that. Now you can tell me it doesn't mean that. But don't tell me it doesn't say that. That's, that's crazy. Ephesians 4, this last month. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. 
Therefore, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of his vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Therefore, I'm sorry, there is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. This one is Pentecostal is set, and this guy just heard a uh, seven day Pentecost. She says, There's only one God, one baptism. There's only one baptism. There's only one baptism because he doesn't care what God said. But what does God say about just, just this one verse, this one narrative? These people call themselves uh, Baptists. What does John say about one Baptist? Matthew 3. The providence of God is strong. It trumps the satanic deception of man made religion, man made Christianity. You're going to believe the Bible or you're going to believe the organization. Hey, stuff in the Bible is just, just, just I mean, like Peter, it's just hard to understand. But eventually, you know, things come to me, you know. But it's fantastic. One baptism, Matthew 3, verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. At our Sunday Saturday morning Bible study, we had a fellow, a new newcomer, and he came and he read that and we were discussing baptism. And he said that he believes there's only one baptism because he'd been raised in this organization. And that just one, just one uh, narrative, just one verse. And he read it and he says, I said, how many baptisms? He says, one. I said, try reading it again. He read it again. He said, oh, there's two. I said, try reading it again. He read it again. He says, you know, there's three. I said, yes. So there's more than one, bat one baptism in the Bible that you read. He said, you know, I, I, did, I just never noticed that, <laughs> you know, because the <laughs> gospel be here is here to them who are lost and the God of this world is blind to the minds of them, lest they believe in the glorious gospel of Christ. But hmm, I would love to prosecute this uh, subject of water baptism being uh, corrupted by man made Christianity. And I don't have the time to continue further than that. And that is free. God, your word, uh, the simplicity in your word is so simple and so easy to understand that we simply believe that you are not a man that you should lie, neither the son of man that you should repent. Because as you said it, shall you not do it? Had you spoken it, shall you not make it good? And we believe that. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brother George. All righty. Um, yeah. And just give me a second here to get myself. All righty. I want to thank Brother George for the message there. Amen. And um, we're going to um, get ready for. Pastor Daryl Cavanis here in a moment. Um, I'm bad with remembering time, uh, but I've how long I've gotten to know Brother Daryl Cavanis. So um, one of my deficiencies about memory is again having markers that I can point to to specify period in time when I got to know someone or, or anything for that matter. 
but uh, I've come to know Brother Daryl Cavanis uh, for for a number of years now. He's a pastor of Westside uh, Grace Church in Muskegon, Michigan. And uh, dear brother, love him, his wife, Rita. Uh, they took the ministry there at Westside Grace and uh, have been marching forward ever since. And uh, they're an encouragement to us, have been an encouragement to us. Um, and uh, I'm just going to um, give you about five minutes. I know we said we'll start them at 10.15. Um, we've been working, by the way, we've been working on some technical problems here. I know there, there was a switch, uh, at which it confused Brother George there. Um, that was because we were testing switching from my desktop to my cell phone. And that apparently caused a, a delay or an interruption. And, um, but we sorted that out. But that's, those are some things that we've been working behind the scenes, trying to make sure everything is recorded and uh, everything progress and transition uh, smoothly. Now, we've been delighted, by the way, uh, at the numbers uh, in attendance here thus far. Uh, I'm sure we've been trying to also uh, stream this live on Facebook. We were able to figure that out, how to get the live stream to Facebook on our Short Bible Church South page. And I think it's streaming live also on my personal uh, Facebook page. We were trying to do YouTube, but I think we could only do either Facebook or YouTube. So it's on Facebook Live where if you have friends that aren't using Zoom but would like to access the meeting by way of Facebook, there's a link. Uh, we have found that uh, some have tried the link. It doesn't seem to work for them. I'm not sure why. We've been exploring that. But uh, it does work. If you don't have Zoom or you know people who don't have Zoom, don't want to call in, but would still like to attend the meeting, sit in on the meeting, they can do so through Facebook. Um, other than that, I'm going to go ahead and say to Pastor Darrell, if you want to prepare to come on up, I will start you about five minutes early here. That's okay. Um, and in between time, I'll try to have a little bit more information for you, something a little bit more informative for you in between time. All right, Brother Daryl, uh, where did you go? I am not sure. <laughs> um, uh, I think, hang on. Uh, you, you, okay. Okay. All can right. you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you. All right. So you go right ahead. You take over. Well, uh, before we get started, I'd like to ask God, the Holy Spirit, to uh, assist uh, in our study today. I want to uh, thank uh, Brother uh, Crump for the wonderful uh, message on uh, baptism. Uh, and today we're going to be speaking about eternal security. So uh, if you would, let's bow our hearts in a brief word of prayer. Our God and our Father, we just want to thank you for another opportunity to stand in your stead. And Lord, we ask that God, the Holy Spirit, will quicken our minds, uh, will reach out to every heart, especially those that don't know you as Savior. Lord, we, we ask that this uh, uh, conference would be edifying, that our inner men would get uh, filled and, and, and sustenance, uh, Lord, and help me to make the distinctions that matter most as we look into your word of wisdom. We just ask that you continue to lead and guide us. It's in Christ's name that we do pray and give thanks. Amen. So if you would, 
Um, my text today is coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 15, my text verse. Uh, and again, the, the topic this morning is eternal security. And I know that in professing Christendom, a lot of times there's uh, the misconception that is propagated that you can uh, be saved and then backslide, that you uh, can have salvation and then at some point become lost again. But um, I, I have a few uh, main thoughts that we're gonna try to unpack today. And I hope after the message, we have a better handle on just how sound salvation is. Um, and the implication being that God knew our frailties before he crafted our salvation. He didn't leave out uh, any of our frailties. He knows all about uh, our imperfections and you know, when you read scripture, it actually hints to the fact that the fault in, in God's first plan of salvation was in the weakness of the flesh. So if you would uh, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. Um, and before we get underway, I, I have three main points that we're gonna to try to expound upon today. Well, actually four. Uh, the first question that I'd like to try to, to get answered from scripture is, does what you do determine whether you're saved or not? Question number one, does what you do determine whether you're saved or not? I think if we answer that question and you get to the bottom of what scripture says about how salvation works uh, and whether it's tied to your works, then you'll have a better understanding about the origins of true salvation. Question number two, how does God impute righteousness to mankind? Question number two. How does God impute righteousness to mankind? And as we explore that question, I think you'll, uh, you'll really enjoy the fact that God, uh, he has um, a certain way that he goes about crafting salvation such that um, he kind of moves everything that would trip us up out of the way. The third point that we'd like to examine a bit closer today is, how do I trade my righteousness for his? You know, the scripture says, man's righteousness is as filthy rags. And that lets you know that God doesn't have a very high value on what we want to offer him instead of what he will accept. If you go back in the scripture to when uh, Cain decided that he was going to slay his brother Abel, the reason why he was upset is that he brought his own offering, which God never asked for. Matter of fact, God never asked for any offering for sin at all, but he did say, if you must do something about your sin problem, this is what I will accept. And Cain had a better idea than God, and so he brought something other than what God said he would accept. Then God, still loving Cain, went to Cain and said, if you do well, won't you be accepted? He reasoned with Cain. He wanted Cain to go ahead and offer the proper sacrifice that he had specified that he would accept. And instead of doing that, Cain had a better idea than God. And that's what a lot of us do in professing Christendom. We don't care, like Brother Crump said, about what Scripture says 
about what God designates. God is sovereign, and we forget that. God says, this is what we're doing now. This is how salvation is going to work. And we tell God, no, we like the old plan better. Well, question number three, how do I trade my righteousness for his? Talking about trading my filthy rags for the righteousness that's offered through the shed blood of Christ. And then finally, question number four is actually posed for us in scripture. Turn with me. It's actually found in Romans chapter eight and verse 35. The final question is who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Betty. So we're going to um, I did. examine those four questions from Scripture and try to answer them directly from the Word of God. Amen. Well, as we um, look at the topic of eternal security, I guess my first thought is, can a man undo what only God can do? When you spend any time in God's word, you'll find that salvation is such a wonderful operation of God, and it's only him who can save us. Well, Let's begin at our text verse, which is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 15. Notice what it says. For anybody who questions whether you're once saved and always saved, or whether you can be saved and lose salvation. Notice what this verse says, what God's word says about how salvation works. Talking about us going before the judgment seat of Christ and having our lives evaluated by Christ himself and, and, and see how God handles salvation, uh, even though there are some things that fall short. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 15, and it reads, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Well, what is he talking about? Well, the works that we do in our life, once we're saved, they're going to be tried by fire to see whether or not they were done for the right motivation. And those that burn up in the fire were done for a selfish reason. And those that survive, will receive a reward for it. Well, if you read the, the pre, prior verses, you'll, you'll see the background uh, that setting that this is the judgment at, uh, of saints after they, they passed on and they're at the judgment seat of Christ. It says, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. So even if you messed up and you did something out of a selfish motivation, and it got and it and it burned up in the fire the test of God's uh, uh, justice. It burns up. Well, you're not going to get rewarded for something that you did for your own ego. You're going to get rewarded for the things that that you do for the love of Christ. If you did. Uh, something to be seen of men and for notoriety and, and all those different selfish motivations, when that work goes into the fire, it's going to evaporate. Well, it says, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, talking about the eternal rewards that we'll receive for the works that actually pass the inspection. He shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. How is that, that if you can be lost again after you're once saved, 
This verse says that even if you do something that does not pass the test, you yourself shall be saved. Listen, folks, we need to put the right value on the word of God. And, and, and what's happened is, is that man through vanity has tried to define God without consulting God. And that's the true definition of vanity or religion. And God has gone out of his way to, to uh, reveal himself to mankind, to tell us who his son, Jesus Christ is, uh, all through the word of God. Well, um, we're going to continue to look at what the common uh, conception is in professing Christendom as compared to what the word of God says, because that's the standard by which we're all going to be judged one day. Well, that, that takes us to our first question uh, concerning salvation, which is, does what you do that being works. Does what you do determine whether you're saved or not? Can you earn it? Can you ever deserve it? Can you pay for it? Is it in any way linked to your effort? If it is, you have to know that you're never going to be able to do enough because God is perfect. And the one thing that cannot be in heaven is sin. Well, we'll get into the verses that support that statement. Come with me to Romans chapter three. Remember the question that we're, we're looking at now is, does what you do determine whether you're saved or not? Come with me to Romans chapter three. Romans chapter 3, and let's, let's start at verse 19. Romans chapter 3, verse 19 says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it said to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. So if you had designs on working your way to heaven or working out your own soul salvation, which is popular to be, uh, to be heard in professing Christendom, if you hold designs on earning your way to heaven, this verse tells you that the, your efforts are futile. The design of the law was never to justify human flesh, but to drive us to the cross, knowing that we need a savior. Notice what God says in the very uh, next verse. Verse 20 says, therefore, by the deeds of the law. Now, I want you to see if before we finish this verse, I want you to uh, really tune in. Uh, let's see if there's any mitigation uh, of any kind in God's language in verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be what? Justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The purpose of the law was to prove to us that we need a savior. It brings sin to light. It shows us ourselves in the mirror. When the Holy Spirit uses the law the way that God designed it, he basically takes a mirror that actually shows our secret secrets to us, puts our heart, if you will, on display. Come with me to down to verse 23. And in your own, in your own time, you feel free to read through this whole section of scripture. It all goes together. But the, the point that I'm driving at, since the question is, does what you do determine whether you're saved or not? Verse 23 is imperative that I bring out. Notice what it says. Romans 3 and 23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all in the same boat. 
Nobody meets the standard that the law puts forth because God is perfect, God is holy, and God is just. The law requires what? Perfection. And none of us except Christ meet that standard. He's the only exception. Come on down to verse 26. Verse 26 says, talking about uh, salvation, he says to, to uh, Paul says, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. The righteousness of God comes from Christ, not our deeds. Verse 27 says, where is boasting then? It is excluded. You can't take credit for your salvation at all because it had absolutely nothing to do with your own personal effort. It's all by and through what Christ did. Not only did Christ die for us, but he lived a perfect life for us that excluded one sin. He never dropped the ball when it came to fulfilling the law. Now think about that, folks. Even after we get saved, we still struggle with certain parts of our Adamic nature. We still slip up from time to time and sin after we're saved. Do you know that Christ was tempted in all parts and the scripture says he was yet without sin? That means he never sinned. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Verse 28 says, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So to answer your question about does what you do determine whether you're saved or not, this verse couldn't be more clear, that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. The deeds of the law start uh, coming into your life because you feel gratitude for the salvation that you received. And if you truly want God to feel like he got what he paid for, then you're not going to want to frustrate the Holy Spirit. It's all about your motivation, folks, why you do what you do, not what you do. Come with me to the 14th book of Psalm. The 14th book of Psalm. And let's go and look at the first three stanzas. The 14th book of Psalm and stanzas one through three. I want you to listen to David, uh, who like Abraham was one of the few uh, examples of salvation by grace through faith in under the old covenant. Notice what the psalmist David writes in the 14th book of Psalm. He says, it says, to the chief musician, a psalm of David, the fool have said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy, like filthy rags, folks. Become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Do you know the only exception to that psalm is Christ Jesus himself? Come with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Does what you do determine whether you're saved or not? Ephesians chapter 2, 
Ephesians chapter 2 and come down and let's look at verses 8 and 9. See what God says about how salvation works in the dispensation of grace. Under Israel's plan of salvation, the reason why they, they had to perform works is because they would not believe God unless he gave them a sign. The Jews required a sign. And to whom much is given, much is required, because they would not believe God unless he gave them a sign. They also had to prove their faith by their works. Notice what God says about how salvation works today in the dispensation of grace. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So the scripture is answered question number one, I think, quite well, which takes us to question number two. How does God impute righteousness to mankind? And why? Why does he have to impute it? Well, let's take a look into God's word of wisdom. Come with me to Romans, the book of Romans, chapter 4. Romans, chapter 4, and let's start at verse 16. Romans, chapter 4, and verse 16. Remember, the question is, how does God impute righteousness to mankind? And why? Well, let's take a look at Romans uh, chapter 4 and verse 16. We're going to read verses 16 through 24 to see if it'll shed a little light on that question. Notice what it says. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end, the promise might be sure. Because if it were by works, how would you ever know if you've done enough? You could never know because you could never do enough. That's the difference between having a no-so salvation and having a home-so salvation. I know my salvation is based on what Christ did and not on what I do. That's why I can rest. He said, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, talking about the children of Israel, but to that also, which is of faith, the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, both the, the program of salvation for the nation of Israel, the children of Israel, and the church, the body of Christ, the children of faith. As, verse 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Verse 18, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. He took God at his word. Verse 19, and being not weak in faith. Listen, I want you to listen to what follows because it points out how strong the faith of Abraham was. And verse 19, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. Why does it say his body was dead? Abraham was over 90 years old, far past childbearing youth. Yeah. And he never balked at what God told him he was going to do. His own body now dead, when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Not only was he old, but Sarah was old. Both of them were far past childbearing years. Verse 20, verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Do you know that when you trust what God says, he gets the glory that he deserves. Yeah. Trusting the one who's never lied 
makes the most sense out of everything. But what happens in the world and in a lot of professing Christendom is that a lot of times people will put more faith in the whisperings of Satan, who's never been totally honest. Listen, folks, God, like Brother Crump just brought out, he's not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Verse 21 says, and being, talking about Abraham, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Trusting God is the same thing as being righteous in his eyesight. You guys see that? It's right there in verse 22. And therefore, talking about Abraham's what? Faith in God, not in himself, not in his flesh, not in the limitations of his flesh. He didn't stagger. He didn't listen to the little whispers of Satan when Satan told him, you're too old to have a son. You don't think Satan mentioned that to Abraham? And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Verse 23 says, now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. Get this, folks. This is where we come in. Verse 24 says, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. And that kind of really addresses question number two. Come with me to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians, we're going to come back to Romans. Uh, so hold your hand in Romans. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and come down and get verse 22. We're talking about the two federal heads here. One man got us into this mess of sin, and one man gets us out of this mess of sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 22, talking about how uh, righteousness gets imputed. Well, Sin was imputed all to one, all of mankind through one federal head, and so is righteousness if we believe. Notice what 1 Corinthians 15 and 22 says, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. How? By those verses we just read through faith. Yeah. Romans 6 and 23, come back to Romans. Romans 6 and 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift, see what God calls his salvation? But the gift of God, can you earn it? Can you pay for it? Can you ever deserve it? No, because it's a gift. God doesn't give things like us and take them back. If he gives something to you, it's because he wants you to have it. That's the proper way to give a gift. That's how we should give gifts. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Come with me to 2 Corinthians. How does God impute righteousness to mankind is the question, and why? Come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And let's come down and take a look at verse 21. How? How does God impute righteousness to mankind? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 says, for he hath made him, talking about Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin. Why? 
when you come across a, the word that in scripture, imagine a little child asking the question, why, why, why? Well, God's getting ready to tell you why. That we might be made or recreated, if you will, the righteousness of God in him, talking about Christ. Amen. That's how God imputes righteousness to us. Through the death, burial, and resurrection of his son. So, again, did you have anything to do with that? It's all excluding any boasting about any of our own effort. It's all about what Christ has already done. Which takes us to question number three. How do I trade my righteousness for his? Man's righteousness is as filthy rags. Do you know what God allows us to trade for the righteousness of Christ? The scripture says that a man's heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. And he poses a question in scripture. He says, who can know it? And the scripture also says something along these lines. It says that God searches to and fro in the earth for a heart turned towards him. That's right. How do I trade my righteousness for his? You have to give him your heart. All you can give God, no effort, no deeds. The only thing that God wants from us is our faith from our heart in the blood of Christ. All you can give God is your heart. And that's all he's ever wanted. How do I trade? my righteousness for his. Come with me to Ephesians chapter one. Ephesians chapter one, and let's start at verse five. And we're gonna kind of skip. Uh, we're gonna look at verse five, verse seven, and then we're gonna pick it up at verse nine. But I would recommend reading from the beginning of the chapter all the way through verse 14. But for sake of brevity, we're just going to stop at a couple verses here, and then we'll get into the meat of Ephesians uh, chapter 1. Notice Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5 said, talking about God and the way he works out his salvation, we're actually going to see how God says salvation works. Paul says, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. God's salvation is just because he's good, not because we're good. It's because of his great love for us. You know, John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It doesn't say that God loved the world. God does love the world, but it says he loved us so, so much that he gave his only son. He gave all that he had. He gave us his best gift. He held back nothing from us. According to the good pleasure of his will, Come with me to verse seven. In whom, talking about Christ, his only begotten son, in whom anytime in this, this past group of, of verses, when you see in whom, it's referring to Christ Jesus himself. In whom we have redemption through his blood. How? His blood, his blood, his blood is what washes us clean. 
in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded, and I know it, um, uh, he, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he had purposed in himself. He decided to save us just because he's that good. That in verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. The, 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 the two plans of salvation, the church, the body of Christ is going to reside in the heavens. And the program of salvation for Israel is going to be fulfilled on earth. The tree of life is coming down from God out of heaven in New Jerusalem. And it's going to be on planet earth. We're not going to have a right to the tree of life. Anything that talks about God in the earth and, 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 and the fulfillment of promises is talking about Israel and the, the, the manifest destiny of the church, the body of Christ, is heaven. Once we go up, we're going to be with Christ forever in the heaven. Who do you think we're going to replace? We're going to replace those principalities and powers, the rulers of darkness and high places that sided with Satan, those fallen angels. That's, the, that's where the church, the body of Christ, is going up into the heavenlies, and Michael's going to kick them out and send them down to earth. When we go up, they're getting evicted. Why do you think they hate the church so much? We're their replacements. Verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. He knows what's best for us better than we know for ourselves. <clears throat> Verse 12. Why? Why did God work salvation out that we couldn't take credit for anything? Verse 12 kind of deals with that. It says that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. We're the ones who actually put our faith in Christ before the children of Israel. Paul said it like this, behold, I show you a mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. We have Israel's Messiah. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. They were the first ones to have access to the, the word of God. And they are going to be the last ones to believe that he is who God said he is. They're going to realize that us Gentile dogs put faith in Christ before they did. How embarrassing. Verse 13, which I like to call the, the equation of salvation says, in whom, talking about our Savior, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed, what does it mean when God seals something? Is that something that a man can undo? Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Which is the earnest or down payment, if you will, of our inheritance talking about the rest that God has promised us. What are we waiting for? What The only thing that we're lacking with the salvation that we have in the church, the body of Christ, is our glorified body that we'll get at the rapture. God's going to glorify Christ and us at the same time. And we'll get our glorified body that will never, ever get tired, never get sick again. It'll have all the abilities that the risen Savior had when he rose from, from Calvary's cross which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. 
Yeah, I often wonder how we're going to get glorified at the same time of, of Christ's glorification. Well, it's to God's glory that he worked out a salvation that was so mighty it could, it could undo all that Satan had done to try to condemn man to the lake of fire. That's some good news, folks. How do I trade my righteousness for his? Come with me to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. And come down and get verses 20 through 24. I want you to see God's attitude towards anybody that's willing to turn their heart towards him. It doesn't matter what you've done. Some people actually believe they've, they've sinned so bad that they can never be saved. That, that they somehow the sin they committed is unforgivable. The only unforgivable sin is the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, and that involves the children of Israel. You know, um, um, in the tribulation period, God's going to um, allow folks that are believers to be taken in front of rulers and kings and at that time, Antichrist is going to rule the world. And the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost has to do with either not allowing the Holy Ghost to testify through you to Antichrist, like Stephen did in Acts chapter 7, but denying the deity of Christ as the nation of Israel, that's something only the, the children of Israel will be involved in, is the unforgivable sin. So that's not even something that you can even do. God's blood, Christ, the blood that was shed for you on Calvary is pure enough to wash away any sin. Amen. Notice what it says, Luke chapter 15, verses 20 through 24. Our Savior says, and he arose and came to his father. Talking about the prodigal son, folks. If you're not familiar with the parable of the prodigal son, there were two brothers that were living with their father, and they had not come to the age of majority. Um, and so one of the brothers decided that he wanted his inheritance, and I mean he wanted it right now. So he told his father he wanted what was coming to him. And his father divided up their goods and said, okay, here's your part of the inheritance. Um, in the Jewish tradition, the, old, the eldest would get two-thirds, and the rest of the siblings would share the, the remaining third of whatever goods that the, the parents had. Well, this son couldn't wait. He wanted his, his inheritance while he was young. He went away from his father and went out and lived a riotous life, the scripture says. It's all in the verses preceding verse 20. And he ended up going away and wasted all his money. He ended up having to take a job for a Gentile, which Jews were not even supposed to come in contact with. And what was even worse, he, his job that he got because he started being hungry because a famine fell on the land and nobody, any of the friends that were partying with him, they forgot his name. So nobody would give him anything. So he had to go to work. And the job, the only job that he could get was slopping hogs. Now for a Jew that's not supposed to come anywhere near swine, a job slopping hogs is the worst possible job a Jew could get. And his, his situation was so desperate that it says that he was actually starting to look at the husk of corn that he was feeding the hogs because he was so hungry. Now, finally, he came to himself and he decided, well, even the servants of my father have more than enough to eat. I'm going to go back to my father and tell him I'm not worthy to be his son anymore, and I'll be his servant from now on. I want you to see what happens when he finally gets back home. And I want you to pay close attention 
to what the father is doing in verse 20. This is God telling you his attitude towards sinners. Notice verse 20 in Luke uh, chapter 15. Christ says, and he arose and came to his father, talking about the prodigal son. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. Hold on. Let's, let's kind of take a, a, put a pin in that. You mean to tell me that his father hadn't given up on him? That his father did not turn his back on him? That his father went out to the road every day looking for his son to come back? He had to be at the road every day looking for his son to come back because this verse says that his father saw him a great way off. So he had to be looking for his son's return. Didn't I just tell you that the scripture says that God's looking to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for a heart turned towards him? It's never too late, folks. It's never too late to decide to live for Christ. His father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. You know why that's so significant? Because the father wasn't supposed to run on a Sabbath day. But his love for his child outweighed the law. Verse 21, and the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. What did the ring signify, folks? It signified the signet or status of being his son again. Even though the son was willing to be a slave for his father, his father did not hold his sin against him and reestablish him as his son. He, he was not any less his son than he was when he was born, <clears throat> despite his sin. What is God saying in that? Verse 23, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be married. That's God's attitude towards salvation. Anytime you're ready to come back to God, he's already looking for you way down the road. And he can't wait to see you. That takes us to question number four. Come with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 35. The last question that I want to pose to you is who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword Look at the example of the prodigal that we just examined. Well, come down to verse 38. Well, we got to stop at verse 37. I apologize. The answer to Romans 8.35 is found in verse 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Only through God's love, though. Verse 38, Paul says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Well, 
I don't know how you can be any more clear. But I've got one more verse for you to look at, considering uh, can a salvation once uh, entered into ever be lost. Come with me to 2 Corinthians as I close. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And let's take a look at verse 10. Let's see what God says about how repentance and salvation works, which they can't be the same. Some people in profession Christendom like to teach that uh, to repent means to be godly sorrowful for your sin. If that were true, then if they were one and the same, this verse would not be in Scripture. Notice what it says. Second Corinthians Chapter 7 and verse 10 says, for godly sorrow worketh repentance. So they can't be the same, folks. Repentance and godly sorrow are two separately, distinguishedly different uh, things. Repentance actually is to change your mind about sin. God says at one point that he repented that he made man. Has God ever sinned? If, if repentance means to be godly sorrowful for your sin, you make God a sinner through his own word. It's not possible that it means that. That's my point, folks. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. God says, once you're saved, you're always saved. That's one thing that salvation is not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. You know, that false piety, that false, you know, temporary sorrow for doing something bad that doesn't take into account the sacrifice of Christ at Calvary, that's not going to save anybody. Listen, folks, your salvation is secure in the blood of Christ. And everything that needed to be done to fix what was wrong with us was finished on the cross. Matter of fact, Christ testified as he got ready to give up the ghost. It is finished. Trust him before it's everlasting too late. I turn you back. Um, I turn you back over into the hands of uh, Pastor Art. Um, God bless you all, and I pray that message was edifying. Thanks, Brother Darrell. Um, the doctrine of eternal security, as Brother Darrell just ended by saying, once saved, always saved. Uh, that's a, a malign truth, but a truth nonetheless. I remember reading an article by Pastor Stan, who was asked a question. If you can lose your salvation, in what sense was it ever eternal? Because in Romans 6.23, it says, um, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And again, if you could lose it, in what sense was it ever eternal? Eternal. I want to thank you, Brother Darrell, for, for that message. And let me just say a word about the theme, uh, perfecting our understanding. The, the, the whole idea is really, you know, improving, refining, sharpening our understanding, our knowledge, our grasp of, of these particular messages, these doctrines that we're exploring here uh, this morning. Um, then we will hear for our next speaker. I hope you don't mind the rapid recession. We'll give you a few minutes here, a couple of minutes. Um, and um, if I, um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to just pause here for a moment and give you about five minutes or so. And then we'll have uh, Brother Bob Brown come up and give his message.